Hello, my name is Emmy DeGrappa. Each week, we bring you stories asking our guests the question why. We learn about passion, purpose, and the human experience. Brought to you by Wyoming Humanities, with the generous support of the Wyoming Community Foundation, this is What's Your Why? Today, we are talking to Gregory Hinton. Gregory is an author, filmmaker, and playwright, also creator and producer of Out West, a historic national program series dedicated to illuminating the history and culture of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and two-spirit communities in the American West. Welcome, Gregory. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I just want to start at the beginning because you have such an interesting story to tell. Where were you raised? Uh, I was born in Wolf Point, Montana on the Fort Peck Reservation. My dad was a country newspaper editor. We moved down to Cody, Wyoming when I was two, where I took over the uh, Cody Enterprise, which was originally founded by Buffalo Bill. And so we lived in Cody for for about seven years. So that was, I was a little boy. And then we moved down to Denver when he got a job with the Forest Service, when he found out that he was not going to be able to uh, send us to school and uh, kind of provide for him him and my mom later on. So he ended up as uh, Chief of Public Affairs for the Bureau of Land Management of Colorado. Um, he was a, a writer, an outdoors guy, and just a wonderful dad. And what was your decision to move to LA and make that your home for the past 30 years, or I should say Hollywood? Well, I I call it an evacuation, actually. I attended the University of Colorado at Boulder, and that was just going to be just the coolest, most wonderful experience I had. But uh, there into my life, a little darkness fell when I came out. And uh, my coming out was uh, kind of, I lost control of it, if you will. Uh, It uh, spread over campus to friends of mine from high school and that sort of thing. And I ended up uh, kind of feeling so threatened that I I wanted to drop out of school. My folks were really wonderful and supportive, although this was all new to them. And uh, my brother also, it turned out, was gay. So uh, they had two gay sons and uh, both of us were in some emotional turmoil, largely because, well, I mean, a theology student called my folks and threatened to drive me out of Boulder with whips and chains. And it was just so stereotypic and ridiculous and cruel, but it left its mark. And so the second my brother could move, uh, he left. And I I followed a year later after I graduated. And uh, he uh, was living in Laguna Beach with, uh, with a hairdresser to the stars. And uh, so uh, I, I stayed with them for a while, and then I met a fellow when we moved to Palm Springs, and he was on his way to uh, have his dad set him up in a gay bar because they heard they were good business in, in, a, in a place called Cathedral City out of Palm Springs. And so it was just, it's been an adventure. It's just all been highs and lows, but uh, just mostly very grateful that uh, California was uh, so welcoming. But of course, I, I I wanted to know where I come from because I'm a writer. And uh, so that's what started the, uh, you know, the desire to to come back, uh, particularly to to Wyoming, because those were formative years. And I basically wanted to go through all of my dad's old Cody Enterprises. So I went to the morgue at the Park County Archives, and they hand me all of these big boxes for the dates that I needed. And the first box, I probably two or three papers in, there's a cover photograph of me as a young kid, which I sent to you, which was taken. And that was the full front page of the Cody Enterprise uh, in 19... 56, because I was going to supposedly the New Year's baby of 57, although I was a big baby even then. And I just thought, like, his newspapers, like, or became a family Bible to me. They were they were a family scrapbook because he, he took a lot of photographs. He won awards, you know, Look Magazine, Best Sports Photo of the Year for a, a stampede picture he took. And I really just fell in love with Wyoming all over again. And I had the benefit. My, my dad died too young. He died in 19, when he was 64 of lung cancer. But his friends from Cody were still around. And he kind of knew Al Simpson. So I wrote a letter to Al Simpson saying, I'm this guy. And I 
you know, whatever. And he said, if you're thinking of coming back to Wyoming, get on back, it's home. And, and Al paved the way for me at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, where he was chairman. My dad's other close friend was a guy named Ernie Goppert, um, who was also the other chairman. And, uh, and these old grandfathers of Wyoming put their arms around me. I told them I was gay and, you know, I was wanting to do a tribute piece to my dad and my family. And they were wonderful. Every every stereotype you would have about Wyoming, because I was told by friends here, don't go there, they'll kill you like they killed Matthew Shepard. And like I say, it was it was the grandfathers of Wyoming that uh, that are why I'm sitting here talking with you today, because it's been a wonderful, wonderful adventure. And so I hope I can tell you more about it today. Well, it sounds like they really embraced you and um, have an attitude that you live free in Wyoming. But it does have a very, you know, um, Callaway reputation, which has always been more of a redneck stereotype. That's why I was so intrigued about your your Out West series, because then you, there you're exploring a different side of the American cowboy. So tell me more about that. I wasn't planning to do this at all. I, I've been working on a novel that I could never get published about growing up in Cody called Night Rodeo, and it was set against the backdrop of, obviously, rodeo and a small town newspaper. And I was doing research at the, what is now the Autry Museum of the American West, but it's Gene Autry's museum that he uh, founded kind of right near Disney, where I used to have a job also. And um, I went in and because it was the Autry, they have a, a great history of Western film from from Tom Mix all the way to Dances with Wolves at the time. And so it's a very, very beautiful film gallery with a lot of ephemera and props and that sort of thing. And, and I noticed that the film Brokeback Mountain wasn't represented and I thought that it should be. So I came home and I, and, and I, this wasn't my business to be telling them what to put in their museum. I was just there to research. And, but I had a friend, a librarian who was helping me. And I went home and I asked my partner, Tom, whatever happened to those shirts from Brokeback Mountain? And if you've seen the film, they both wear these, basically these inexpensive Rock Mount cowboy shirts uh, that they love and are threadbare. And uh, in the end of the film, the Heath Ledger character uh, takes Jake Gyllenhaal's character's shirt, puts it on a rack over his shirt and puts them ceremoniously back into the closet together. So Tom, I said, so whatever happened to those shirts? And and he said, I think they were sold at auction. And I Googled them, thank God. And they've been sold at auction by a Hollywood memorabilia collector for $100,000. And he had to sign a piece of paper that he wouldn't destroy them and that he would never separate them because they came on the same rack. Uh, they had never been you know, separated. And uh, so we bought him and he gets, I, I write a cold email. It's none of my business, but I think your shirts belong in the Autry. And I, I remember I sent it January 1st of that year, 93, 94, I can't remember. And he writes back the very next day saying, meet me tomorrow. And I have no idea who he is. I meet him and his partner are major philanthropists like worldwide build museum generous fellows and he said i don't think they're going to let you do it but uh, uh the shirts are are yours to set up there if you want and so i contacted my friend marva felchlin at the octree and, and she put it to uh her boss. And uh, six months later, there they were installed in the Autry Film Gallery with Mrs. Jean Autry attending and, and the press went kind of nuts over it. And I thought I needed another hook. So uh, I knew about, you know, there is the International Gay Rodeo Association and I knew about them. And I thought, well, they must have archives because because when I went looking, I couldn't find anything about gay people in the American West in any established historical institution. So I can I write a letter to the president of IGRA and he says and they say it's none of my business but if you have archives I think they'd be cool in a western uh, you know in a western library at the Autry 
he said, sure, go ahead and try and make it work. So a month after we installed the shirts, two gay cowboys, historians, their, 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 their archives were impeccable. And he told me that they were stored in the basement of Charlie's, which was a Denver Western gay bar. And I went to Denver, went down into the basement, and there were these pristine boxes, bankers' boxes of the gay rodeo archives. And they were stored on, on a bunch of beer kegs in the closet off the drag show dressing room downstairs. And so from that space, they were transferred Lovingly, they, they didn't want to ship them because they thought that they'd be destroyed by some horrible person. So they drove them personally over the Rockies, dropped them off at the Autry Museum's loading dock. They were processed and a Harvard PhD candidate came and went through all of them. And now she's created this whole scholarship on gay rodeo. Her name is Rebecca Schofield, and she's a professor at the University of Idaho. So, so it was just, this was all just so whimsical. It's not I had a notion and I acted on it. Um, and again, it was none of it was was my business, but the press, the media loved it. And um, and then other in, other Western institutions were interested in it as well. And and the Autry was just so amazed at the positive public response they got because they were considered a very conservative. You know, it was Ronald Reagan's kitchen cabinet that was their their board and uh, they uh, said, why don't you create a program series for us? And and we called it, I, I was walking around the reservoir here and I thought, well, well, duh, we'll call it Out West at the Autry. So I did programming for them for several years and then I started reaching out to other Western museums and, you know, now I've had, I mean, I think you've seen the list, but I presented so many unique out West programs around the country. And uh, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful ride. And that brought me back to, back to Cody proper. Has the gay community embraced this, you know, idea that um, there are gay cowboys and oh, what, what do they say about that? It just surprised everybody. I had only been to one gay rodeo and they had it at the equestrian center years before I did all of this. And I'd been away from rodeo. I hadn't been to a rodeo since I was a kid. So I, I remember going to this and just looking like, well, this, what's gay about this? This is just a bunch of cowboys. And they were doing all of the same, you know, calf roping, you know, bull riding, all of the same stuff. And it was, they were just all men. And there were also, you know, gay women there as well. It just looked like a regular rodeo of my childhood. It didn't. It wasn't any different than they do the, you know, the flag. They they they, they do everything that is that a quote straight rodeo does, and it just started as as one or two, and then it built up, and pretty soon there were gay rodeos kind of bloomed in other states, you know, around the country. Not all of them by any means, but uh, I have to say I, I really have not had any kind of blowback. I go to a lot of quote red states. That what we call them now. And I've never, I, I was thinking as I was anticipating talking with you today, do you know kind of who've been some of my kindest allies have been straight men of faith who just have been so gentle and, and considerate and they respect what I'm trying to do. And they know I'm not there to, you know, that this is a gentle, this is a gentle program. It's, it's not meant to, uh, to uh, inflame emotions. It's just meant to kind of just establish that, you know, we're peaceful cowboys and cowgirls and just want to live our lives um, the way we wish and not hurt anybody. I mean, that's basically it. It's just, we want to live as we wish to live without hurting anyone. And that's when Al Simpson puts his arm around you, man, you're like, <laughs> it was major. It was just major. And that's, I, I sent you, I think, the Los Angeles Times piece because mm -hmm. the LA Times just got intrigued about what I do and and asked, how could we cover it? And I said, well, we've got to go to Cody and go to the uh, Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And and we went in and Al came to lunch at the Irma Hotel with us. And uh, <laughs> he was just, it was, he was just so wonderful. And you know why I thought to reach out to Al? Actually, he, he was on Bill Maher's show, if you've ever watched it. And Bill Maher, he said, Bill Maher made a crack about Al being from the state where they kill gay people. And I was watching and I was offended, you know, and I'm a gay man and I know what, what terrible things have happened. 
uh, you know, obviously. And, and Al just exploded at Bill Maher. He took his breath away. He said, the people of Wyoming were offended by the murder of Matthew Shepard. And how dare you accuse us of, of, of not being sympathetic uh, to, to we, we, we believe in, we stand for live and let live in Wyoming. And how dare you insult me and the people of Wyoming. And it was like, wow. And so <laughs> I, I, I wrote him this, this letter reminding him who my dad was and what I was doing. And I just, I'm not somebody who wrote senators by any means, you know, it's a matter of daily activity. And I, then I was embarrassed. I thought I shouldn't. And I get this beautiful letter from Al um, just welcoming me back and just uh, remained so powerful. Um, and obviously I, I know he and Ann and, um, and Pete and Lynn were in one of my plays. We did a reading of it and at the museum. And uh, so it's just, there, there, there will never be another one like Al. So it's, it's pretty cool. I think Al Simpson is a very generous person. Yes. And uh, a, a loving person. And uh, I think you may have read that. I'd been in the film industry for 20 years and I, I was an executive producer for a film director named Randall Kleiser and his biggest best known film was the film Grease. And, um, you know, we had pr production deals with Universal and Disney and all of these places. And, and at a point I decided I, I really wanted to not be the guy next to the guy. And I had this, you know, I had novels that I'd already written and had published and I just wanted to devote myself to my own creative career. And so I left and, and I applied for a fellowship and I did, I thought, oh, this, you know, it was a terrible risk and it's, it remains a terrible risk not to have the security. But I heard about UCROSS Foundation through Annie Prue's book, The Shipping News, which I loved, I, you know, and so I looked it up and I decided that I would apply to UCROSS and I got accepted because I wanted to come and work on Night Rodeo there. And I recall thinking that, and my friends were, don't go to Wyoming, don't go to Wyoming. It's, why do you want to go there? They hate people there. And it was just, no, no, you know. And it was, that was what really changed my course for good because I was able to base camp there and go over the, you know, the little big horns to Cody and just reintroduce myself to the museum. And there was different leadership there, but they were, you know, as I say, when Alan Ann Simpson are, invite you to their table, people, you know, I, it was it was the first time I felt like a, a rich man's son. Do you know what I mean? It's like I, that 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 those doors that open just because of the influence of of he who brung you. And so it's uh, that's that's why um, I, I love that museum so much. And uh, I was a kid at the brown groundbreaking of the of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in 1958. I remember it when I gave a talk at uh, at the museum several years ago to a, to a group of Codyites. I said, "Does anybody?" And I always say, "I I attended the groundbreaking of this museum in 1950, 58, 59. Was anybody else here?" Is anybody here who who also was there? And the only and the only other person who was there was Ann Simpson. <laughs> so it was just like so. Anyway, I remember my dad specifically digging a hole in the ground and throwing some dirt with the shovel as a as a five six year old kid. I just I can still see that picture. And uh, we just lived two blocks up the up the street from the from where the museum was being built on. Uh, 1037 Canyon Avenue. So be, because my mom and my dad and my brother all passed away so young, my dad at 63 and my brother at 50 and, and my mom at uh, 74, that was all, all smoking related. It just makes me, uh, your, the, the morgue of your, uh, of your community newspaper should be a family album for, for everybody and if 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 one bothers to go look, you know, you 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 you'll find yourself in the pages is the thing. So so that's that's really what continues to launch all of this. And uh, I I brag on 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 Cody and the Buffalo Bill everywhere I speak, which is now all over, kind of all over the all over the West certainly, and, and now kind of reaching all the way to Florida and that sort of thing. So. 
That is excellent. You've come a long way. What a, what a great passion and journey you've been on. Tell me how you started and became interested in writing this new play called A Sissy in Wyoming. It might be my downfall, but uh, no, I'm teasing. Um, I read about Larry Sissy Goodwin, who is a Wyoming cross-dresser. He's married, has children. His only difference is that he prefers to wear women's clothing, not unlike, uh, you know. And so anyway, I read about him on the cover, on the front page of the Los Angeles Times. And I was shocked that I, I was I was shocked by the article, and it was written by an, a Times uh, a writer named John Gleona. And I was offended by the title because sissy is a pejorative, and I thought that they were it was they're having it both ways and that sort of thing. But as it happens, uh, sissy Larry Goodwin, who passed away several years ago, um, adopted the name because that's what he was called, and he he wanted to appropriate it as, as his own. So. Uh, I just was so intrigued and I and I wanted to know more possibly to do an out west program about him. I reached out to the writer of the Times and explained what I was doing and he contacts me and he said I've discussed you with our editors at the Times and I'm wondering we would like to do a piece on you. We think your you know your mission is is very unusual and and so we we talked and I he said I he said if you're willing, I, I would really like to meet you and Cody and uh, you could, you know, show me where you lived and tell me more about growing up and what it's like to, you know, be a, a gay kid from Wyoming and, uh, and your dad's, they were, they were intrigued about that. My dad was a newspaper man and, uh, and that we had, I had all the covers of the Cody and the, the, I sent you one, I think, but there were like, covers from spanning seven years full page ads a lot of them were some some of them were taken by jack richard who's a beloved wyoming photographer who was also my dad's friend and uh and who shot for the enterprise and then others were my dad's and uh when i was in cody i, I would just really enlist the passion of the archivists who were you know like at park county archives a, a wonderful woman named lynn stallings who who just was so excited because i was so excited and uh it just was it was just a great story and so i have those that whole collection my mission is also to honor honor my dad's work and, and country editors everywhere because they're undersung and underpaid and so i i've met several folks from the wyoming um newspaper uh, association a guy named jim hicks and bruce mccormick who was the editor of the cody enterprise who i i went back and met and and so uh, i don't know if you saw that picture of the uh, of the kid uh, just falling off a brahma bull at at a cody stampede but uh, my dad shot this photo and uh, it ended up uh, in look magazine and uh, he won you know a wyoming newspaper association prize and uh, uh, it was it was a, a big deal. So now everywhere I go, I open with that shot of that kid. And uh, it just pleases me that, oh, and two years ago, they did a big cowboy exhibit at the Buffalo Bill and Cody. And they blew my dad's photograph up like to this huge, huge size. And you could have your picture taken in front of it. And I, I just seeing my dad's work because i always show it at every museum i lecture at seeing being able to promote my dad's my my dad's artwork um getting him in museums is just he would die a thousand deaths i know how pleased he and my mom would be i, I get to honor him with with his talent but i also get to honor my parents for 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 being in, uh for not for putting their arms around their own two sons and uh, nobody is going to threaten threaten us without answering to them and uh and that's you know it's it's just really great it keeps me close to them every time i talk about them and, and my mom was as much of a hero to me as my dad uh, just just wonderful altruistic people and uh that's what all this journey is about as well were were those hard conversations that you had with your dad when you came out and what what was his reactions? How did he embrace you? That's it's quite a story, actually. Um, I was in Boulder, and um, 
I didn't know about my brother yet, but he was coming out as well. He was he went to the uh, to Fort Collins, Colorado State University, and and I was involved with a group. We I had gotten caught up in the evangelical movement that was coming through Boulder during the the seventy. Actually, they were it was kind of burgeoning around all of the university systems. Um, in in the early 70s and uh, so I had several friends who we had prayer groups and that sort of thing and during one of these sessions I felt like I needed to confide that I I hadn't had any experience as a you know physical experience as a gay man or come out or told anybody but I told them about this and the theological student who went on to Princeton and is a major Presbyterian minister flipped out and uh he tried to cast out our demons. My my friend sitting next to me, it turned out he was gay too. So there were two of us that we didn't know. It's funny if you think about it. And then we had this, this charismatic dancer from, from Canada who went around and danced for the Lord and uh, with, with this group. And it, it sounds insane, but it's this, these are all people of faith and however they, anyway, we were all characters and that's why we liked each other. But this fellow uh, just freaked out and blew everything up. And I was suicidal at that point. And I had to, mm-hmm. they, my folks got, were just very fearful for me. And, uh, well, oh, we had, I, I wanted to say we, we had a, I went home to tell my mom that I thought I was gay. And she said, well, what about Scotty? And, uh, I said, well, he's gay too. So I outed him to them. So she, she was taking a nap and I, I described this in my book. My mom, my mom was somewhat depressed and, um, and let's face it, we all want to take a nap in the afternoon now and then, but I walk in and she was asleep and I woke her and I told her this and I, I remember her getting out of, she, you know, getting out of bed, lighting a cigarette, walking into the kitchen, and she calls my dad at work. He, my dad called her every day from home, to, from work, to tell her he loved her. So she calls him at work, and she says, "We have a serious issue. Uh, you remember what we thought about Scotty?" And I, I'm listening to this, and then she goes, "Well, uh, Greg is to come home." And she hung up. She called my brother, and who's living in downtown Denver with a college professor at DU. <laughs> uh, and she said, we know, come home. She called my sister, who was married and had a husband and a small child. They were students. At, um, she was um, getting her master's degree in, in education. And she said, we're having a family meeting come home, didn't say why. So we had this truly devastating conversation around our our dining room table in our small little brick house up in Green Mountain above Denver. And this all was discussed. And um, uh, I was, I've, I've written about this and spoken about it. I, I, I understand the need for them to want to act so quickly because they felt our lives were going to be at stake. That's all they knew was that we, she, we were going to have difficult lives. And, and the ab- absolute idea was it wasn't, you have to change. You can't do this. You can't da da da. It was, it was, how do we circle the wagons? You know, how are we going to stay intact? Um, how are we going to protect you? How are you going to protect yourself? What, what do you expect you have to gain by this, you know? And, um, and my dad didn't say anything. My dad, my brother was shouting, you know, statistics and figures and, you know, everything that he knew about it. I'm going, I don't want to do this. My, my sister, my, my brother-in-law was a psychology major. So he's trying to like, (laughs) kind of be that guy. And they have their new baby with them, which helped. And, um, and we were never the same again. And I'm not saying we weren't all close. We were remained a very, very close family, but um, they sent me to a psychiatrist because I, I was, I was clearly in trouble. And my brother just was going to go on doing, living his life. And, um, and, uh, and so we never, it was just, it was 
what what I knew is that I would always have oh, and and then the theology student called after the fact. My mom answered, and and that's when he he threatened me. And uh, my dad got on the phone and said, "If you ever call here again, I'll kill you," which I know he would have. And we had thirty firearms in our basement, and that was when I just felt like I had to leave, you know, leave Boulder and and, and drop out and. Uh, so I went to San Francisco for the summer with, with the fellow that uh, was my partner at the time and, uh, and came back, called my mom and said, I want to come back and finish school. So I came back. And, but the university, my, my professors all knew when I dropped out, I was honest about what was going on. And, I, you know, and there, was no, there weren't any resources for a student then. It wasn't. And there, there wasn't any advocacy by the university to, to stop bullying and hazing because I was basically bullied. I, 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 I was bullied out of my education for that time when I left. Um, and, you know, I went to the student health clinic because I was really having a terrible anxiety attack. And I told them what was going on. And they said, well, you're long term, so you can lay down here for a couple for 20 minutes, but you're going to have to find yourself other help. And I mean, you know, there just wasn't, there wasn't any support system yet. It was too, too early. This was, mind you, in, you know, in the mid seventies and just when everything was starting to come out. Um, and I'm fortunate that I, I didn't let it get the best of me. And, but all of everything, all of that informs kind of all the choices I have. I, I have a happy life. I've been a, I have a wonderful partner and we're here both together for 30 years and, We've had nice friends, and uh, and I love what I do so much. Um, so, kind of what it's been about. That's quite a journey. Wow. Um, yeah, and and a lot of heartbreak and emotion, and being an overcomer at the same time. Yeah, that, that's I've not heard that word, and I, I'll, I'll 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 take it. That's uh, that's great. <laughs> I imagine the students or the kids that go home and they get kicked out. I mean literally just kicked to the street with nothing because their families can't handle having a, an LGBTQ kid, trans kids. And that's a long way away from, so I'm circling back to a sissy in Wyoming. Um, I mean, trans kids are just being ostracized and tormented and, and, and murdered. I mean, Wyoming has had several instances of that. And so when I heard about Larry Goodwin, I was busy doing a lot of things. And so I was never able to meet him directly. And by the time I got around to wanting to meet him face to face or do a project about him, um, uh, he had already passed away. So the LA Times, my LA Times friend connected me with Vicki Goodwin and I contacted her. We spoke and I sent her, you know, background of what I do and she said I'd love to meet you and so I went and I stayed with her for a couple of days um, at her house in Douglas they they just have a they were just wonderful record keepers they I mean he was like me has all of this publicity and he had a scrapbook and he had all of his awards and his and photos and and it's just his his story is just really remarkable and and she's an equal partner to it uh, and so that's the really terrific thing, and I, I would like to underscore this as well, is that when I went back to Wyoming, I I, I noticed that uh, when I went looking, I couldn't find my community anywhere in, in Western history institutions, and um, and that's uh, I, I I I went to the University of Wyoming to the American Heritage Center. and I wrote a kind of a proposal saying that we really need an archive of the LGBTQ West. Um, and there are other archives like them, but not, not devoted to, uh, to those of us who, who come from the rural American West. And uh, he thought that that was a good idea. I sent a proposal and um, he said, why don't you come and you can meet the director of, the, of AHC and uh, talk it over because he's kind of interested. So I, I flew out and I meet a fellow named Mark Green. I don't know if you've ever met him, but uh, he was just uh, an internationally acclaimed um, archivist. He had never seen Brook. I, I, I was supposed to meet with Rick and Rick said, well, you need to meet with Mark instead because I'm called out of town. And I thought, oh, great, you know, because I was worried. And so 
I meet, I go in and I meet with Mark. I said, well, have you ever seen Brokeback Mountain? No, I never saw it. And I'm going, oh my gosh. And then I just explained what I wanted to do. And he greenlit it. And uh, we, we decided to call it Out West at the Rockies. In, out West in the Rockies. And it was the first, uh, at the time, uh, this was 2015, uh, it was the first regional um, LGBT Western archive, a uh, dedicated space to, to collect uh, our stories. Um, and then Mark <clears throat> tragically passed away in a terrible accident on between, uh, between Laramie and uh, Cheyenne and uh, in, in a blizzard. And then Rick took over. And so they, they sent me all over. I, I, they said, we'd really like you to go out and promote it, promote out West. And so <clears throat> I started making appointments and I went to Idaho and I went to Utah and I went to Nevada and I went to New Mexico and, uh, <clears throat> and, and Arizona and they underwrote it, the whole thing. Um, and, and as a result, Everywhere I would go, I would speak, and I could I could uh, um, brag on on the University of Wyoming and AHC and uh, and uh, and other. Um, I'm not saying it was because of me, but the value of having dedicated archives to 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 my community started to be embraced by these other institutions. So now there are other, you know, there are other archives that are springing up, kind of dedicated to the to to the the stories of, of those particular states. And uh, so AHC just continues to be a great partner to me. Um, um, Leslie Wagoner, who's the, um, who's the president of the Wyoming Historic Society is also an archivist. I spoke with her and she arranged to do an oral history of Vicki about her life, her own life and her life with Sissy. And so we have 10, 12 hours of, of, her, of her oral history of Vicki, which I was able to use to write a sissy in Wyoming. Um, you know, I could, I could, I, I'm a, I, uh, I'm mostly what you call a verbatim playwright where I adapt the real words of real people and kind of curate them into a, a staged piece. Um, and I've decided that I really like doing playwrights readings um, rather than cast them because it's, it's, it's actually, frankly, it's another check and another plane ticket and all of that. And I, I just really love doing my own work. Um, but so we, I created this piece and, and this is what's also really wild. It's like that old serendipity thing. I did my playwrights reading of it uh, at the Nick and we had a huge attendance and uh, standing ovation and, um, Vicky, who is this beatific, wonderful woman, is sitting on the front row with her daughters who don't know what to make of this whole exhibition about their dad. And, you know, and then here's this guy reading, you know, doing him. I, I don't, you know, I don't dress as sissy. It's a playwright's reading. It's just I, I'm reading my own play. And there's Vicky sitting and their daughter. And it, throughout the play, like, like Sissy loved Vicky, they it's, they they love each other so much, and um, and so I could really like I could work with Vicky, who's sitting on the front row, and I could refer to her, and because a lot of it is Sissy talking to her, and to be honest with you, it was a really nice act, <laughs> and it's all true, but I mean, the emotion of that, and so that's what caused I, I don't know how. I suggested it. I, I just and, and Leslie was was an equal partner, the American Heritage Center, equal partner in it because she supplied the goods. I mean, she 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 dedicated herself, and you know, she's taken my oral history as well now. And um, but she's she's just been such a change agent. She took this over, um, and now uh, and Ricky and I discuss that we'd like to take a tour of Sissy around the state of Wyoming and AHC is sponsoring it. And we're uh, trying to uh, AHC and obviously humanities Wyoming are sponsoring it. And, uh, and, you know, October comes and we're going to drive around and we just got the first, uh, our first response, actually the, f the first one that Vicki sent is uh, 
uh, the Jackson Cultural Center in, in Jackson Hole wants wants us to come, and that's so we want to do maybe about an eight eight community tour in October, which is LGBT History Month, and so Vicky and I will drive and uh, and uh, I'll do a reading every night, and it's you know it's just it's, I don't know it's uh it's I'm I'm so looking forward to it because I've really decided that I love I just love reading these plays. And uh, so it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, it sounds like you're a great um, dot connector, that you connect dots very well. You, you go from one place to another place, you meet this person or that person, and you kind of have the ability to put all these connections together. I, 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 guess, I, I, I guess that actually I will, I will cop to that, having that skill. Um, I just, I have a vision and, um, and, uh, and the media, like I say, has been a great partner to me. I've, I've been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And I've been, um, at most, every time I go to a state uh, or, you know, a city, like the local NPR affiliate will have me on. I, so there's all of this, this great opportunity just to kind of promote um, uh, promote uh, our community's right to come back to the communities that we feel that we have to leave, and uh, and and staying is really what what takes the you know the the mystery out of it all. Just that you know you know my you know people may not sign on to everything one does, but. Uh, but at least they may have that base, basic belief. What anybody's doing is their own business as long as they're not hurting anyone and uh, and uh, are are giving to the community. And that's uh, you know we have to try all that much harder. But uh, but it's I, I just have met just some really really great people. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of just been it's just been a major gift to me this whole thing. Yeah, when you talk about community, I think about, yes, there is a gay community, but there's also a family community. And like you were talking about, these Western towns, they have their own communities and staying in those communities because I, I do believe that, you know, it's person by person and ultimately people do want to accept you and love you. And it's not all rejection. And this is another thing too. Um, I'm, I'm one thing I always express to my audiences wherever I am fortunate enough to speak is I always identify as being HIV positive. I've been HIV positive for over thirty years, um, and I've never hidden it. Um, and and the the community that. Uh, I mean, I've been so fortunate to have have that experience, but I'll often, in addition to often possibly being the only gay person anybody's ever met, I'm, I'm also often the only openly HIV person anybody's ever met. And, and it takes, um, I just, that was just something that I, I was never, ever not going to, going to cop to, um, uh, so that people can see that you can be well and you're, you're safe to be around and all, all of that. So, um, well, you have lots to look forward to for sure. And yes, it is a stressful time in this world. And, you know, sometimes you think about world history and there's always been some kind of stress someplace in the world. It's, yeah. you know, there's, there's always been that push and pull between good and bad or right and wrong. And right. just that's, I, I don't know. I, I always, you know, think about, how we always think we're so evolved, but we're not. We're yeah. still we're still becoming real people all the time. I remember my mom saying, "All I ever wanted of my children is that you be kind." So uh, that's true. I don't know if that's what all mothers wish, and I I'm interested that she. I mean, that was that was just her value. She just didn't understand cruelty. That's right. That's good. And that's what she shared with you. And that's, that's a great legacy that you have of hers to pass on to whoever you meet. I hope so. Yes. 
I've had such a great time talking to you. You have such an interesting story. Gregory, have a beautiful rest of your day, and um, we will be talking soon. And I'll let you know when your podcast launches. Okay. That, this is just so generous of you, and and please thank the gang as well. I'm, uh, I always get so worked up about this, and this is the most comfortable interview I've had, so I, I, I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Actually, it's been, it's, been a, it's been a talk rather than an interview, so uh, I, I just, <laughs> I'm, I'm so great. That's right. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of What's Your Why? Brought to you by Wyoming Humanities with support from Wyoming Community Foundation and generous supporters like you. To learn more, go to thinkwide.org, subscribe, and never miss a show.